the mayor of Edmonton, Don Iveson. Uh, since his election as Edmonton's 35th mayor in 2013, Mayor Iveson has set his sights on transforming Edmonton into a highly uplifting, more resilient, globally competitive, well-governed city that is recognized as one of Canada's very best places to build something great. In his time on council and as mayor, Iveson has earned a reputation for being pragmatic, creative and collaborative in his approach to building the city of Edmonton. Harnessing a renewed energy in the city and with the goal of capitalizing on this incredible growth, his focus is on four key priorities. Building a more uplifting and inclusive city. Second, building a more resilient and green city. Third, building a more prosperous and competitive region. And lastly, leading an effective and open local government. I should also just add that uh, I get the pleasure of working with uh, Mayor Iveson and others in the FCM Big City Mayor's Caucus and can say that Don is a real strong, pragmatic and strategic voice uh, on behalf of Edmonton and on behalf of cities as we discuss the national issues that are important, not only in this election, but uh, in just the way our country works. So Don, welcome. Well, thanks, Brock, and thanks for the nice things you said. <laughs> you ready to go to the first question? Absolutely. Okay. So, Don, you've just launched the Citywide Poverty Elimination Plan, which outlines 28 recommendations in five priority areas and six game changers. Can you give us uh, your top three highlights from the strategy? It's hard to do because it is a very integrated strategy that looks at both lifting people out of poverty who are experiencing it today, preventing it uh, from being transmitted intergenerationally, as it were, uh, so looking at prevention strategies, but it also reaches further than that, uh, and, and we can talk a bit more about it, but really this is not just an economic issue we've discovered in our work. It's, it's a much broader issue around societal inclusion and around human rights and around human dignity, and so uh, the six game changers are, and I'll just say them shortly, and then I'll talk about the three that really stand out. The six game changers are uh, confronting and eliminating racism. The second is around livable incomes. The third is uh, affordable housing. The fourth is affordable and accessible transit. The fifth is affordable and quality childcare. And the sixth is access to mental health services. Now those are just the headline statements, but the three that I think I should expand upon a little bit are um, the the first one in particular, which is the elimination of racism. Um, we have discovered through our consultation with people with lived experience with poverty, be they immigrants and refugees, uh, or uh, be they Indigenous Canadians, that one of the major challenges to full participation in the economy and in society and in our democracy uh, is um, the experience of racism and discrimination and some research that we did here in Edmonton a few years ago with the University of Alberta's Department of Sociology surveyed the experience of racism um, as understood by uh, people from different cultural backgrounds in our community and we found some very disturbing uh, results there for uh, particularly recent immigrants from sub-Saharan Africa they experience uh, levels of racism that are much, much higher uh, than um, immigrants who have been here for a longer time in the uh, maybe second or even third generation in, in the case of Asian and Southeast Asian um, uh, Canadians. But then we also found that uh, the experiences of racism uh, for Indigenous people are off the charts again the worst. And, you know, this is heartbreaking stuff to learn uh, exists in your community, but there are significant um, uh, issues of uh, stigma uh, and misunderstanding um, and discrimination that are experienced uh, by some of our immigrant communities and especially by indigenous communities. And, and it, it became our feeling as a task force, having assembled a group of people from many walks of life and, and uh, from the research community, from the practitioner community, from the faith community, from uh, the business community, we came to a very strong consensus that if we don't address this issue of racism and discrimination head on, um, everything else we do uh, is going to be hobbled by the fact that there is systemic discrimination, not just in Edmonton, but uh, but but across this country. And and um, 
so this is in particular an issue of reconciliation as well for for indigenous people and I, I think we'll come back and talk about that um, so the second one is livable income because although there are definite non-monetary barriers to full participation in community life um, there's no doubt that there is an economic feature uh, or an economic character as well to to poverty for uh, for most people who are experiencing it and that's how we measure it is in is in uh, economic terms and in income terms and so livable incomes is is critical and we've taken a close look at um, whether it's minimum wage models or living wage models which tell us you know what what would a dignified quality of life cost what would you have to earn in terms of hourly wage and there's been much debate across the country and much debate in Alberta of late about uh, the relationship between the minimum wage and the living wage and then we've also taken um, uh, quite a bit of time to look at a concept that has ha seems to be gaining some traction in the national discussion which is the notion of a, a guaranteed minimum income or mincom or guaranteed annual income it has lots of different names but essentially the idea that uh, a negative income tax uh, that everyone should have uh, a minimum stipend uh, to work from whether they're employed or not uh, and that that uh, would deal with the issue of economic inclusion without necessarily trying to reach that through minimum wage adjustments alone for example so we've taken a, a fairly integrated and holistic look at the issue of livable incomes and supported uh, a, a mincom model like uh, what was tried in Dauphin, Manitoba in the 70s and uh, usually the criticism or the concern is that people will um, not want to work if they can be paid uh, even if they're not working and the example in Dauphin that I always like to point to is uh, that uh, there were in fact two groups of people who were more likely to stay out of the workforce uh, when they tried the income experiment there and uh, they were high school students who stayed in school rather than dropping out to work which I think is a good thing and uh, young mothers who stayed home with their children for longer uh, which from a developmental point of view has real benefits as well so everybody else more or less participated in the workforce the same but they did see dramatic decreases in arrests in family violence in hospital visits and so uh, we think there's real benefit in looking at this and, and I think the time has come to renew the conversation about livable incomes in our country and then the third is uh, uh, of, of all of them and I think this one is critical on the prevention front in terms of this idea that uh, you know we've set ourselves a goal to end poverty in a generation because we have to be realistic that it's not something that could happen overnight but the goal uh, is really that a child born in poverty today in our city will not transmit that poverty intergenerationally to their children and um, one of the most important things we can do to help intervene in that uh, child who's experiencing poverty today's life and their family's life is to ensure the provision of affordable and quality uh, not just child care but it's er early learning uh, and care and that enables the success of the child and they're much more likely to be successful in school and be productive and be able to earn and support their family into the future um, and, and of all of the different prevention investments we can make as a civilization, that's the one with the best return on investment. It's also one of the ones with the longest return on investment. But if we're going to take an intergenerational outlook, which I think we have to uh, on issues of this magnitude and complexity, then um, this is one of the most important um, game changers out there. And then it just so happens that it also helps to benefit the um, uh, families who are struggling to make ends meet, particularly lone parent families, which tend to be overwhelmingly headed by women uh, whose ability to earn is impacted by um, child care duties. And so support for that allows them, of course, to either uh, re-engage with education or re-engage uh, in the workforce, which is uh, beneficial not just to them, but uh, to society at large and to the economy. So those would be the three, addressing racism, uh, addressing livable incomes, and uh, ensuring that we have a system of affordable and quality early learning and care. I think of all of them, if we did those, we would get the most mileage there. Wow, thanks. There's an awful lot of wisdom there. I often, I, I know about the Dauphin experience and wondered uh, if anybody was paying attention to what had happened there and, and trying to replicate it. That's very interesting. Second question is, so why is poverty elimination such a priority for the city of Edmonton? 
Well, we, you know, the mythology of Alberta is that this is an extremely wealthy place, and notwithstanding today's price of oil, it, it generally speaking is. Um, but that narrative really masks um, a, a greater diversity of experiences that, that manifests all over the country. But particularly in Alberta, we've seen a, uh, a gap opening up in terms of income inequality. Um, if people are working in certain sectors, they're doing extremely well, able to afford housing, which has doubled or tripled in price here over the last decade. Uh, able to find childcare, which is scarce and expensive here. Able to um, uh, participate essentially fully in community life. Uh, with still, uh, you know, in Edmonton, we have the highest disposable incomes in the country on average. Um, the earnings aren't quite as high as Calgary, but our housing price is a little bit lower, and so uh, you know, we 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 like to celebrate that. Um, but that, that narrative, which we use to attract people here to come be a part of this economy, masks the fact that uh, uh, fully uh, one in eight uh, Edmontonians is living in poverty, which is, you know, as an economic measure, that families are living below the low income cutoff. And um, in a city with housing as expensive as this, uh, that that means that they're in considerable need, uh, at risk of becoming homeless. And I, and I think that that was, in some ways, the seeds of this discussion um, five or six years ago when Tent City sprung up in our city. Actually, it was more like eight years ago. Tent City sprung up in our city. And, um, you know, a, a call rang forth to uh, do something about our exploding homeless population, which had increased from a few hundred to uh, over 3,000 over the course of a number of years. And this tracks income inequality. This tracks the housing prices rising and more and more families being on that uh, in that housing insecure and income insecure position relative particularly to the cost of housing and so our uh, uh, my predecessor Mayor Stephen Mandel and and many community leaders came together at about the same time this was happening in Calgary and about the same time that the province was starting to look at this and uh, Calgary and then Edmonton and the province all passed uh, or, or sort of endorsed 10-year plans to end homelessness, which was an important transformation in our thinking from managing homelessness or trying to reduce homelessness to actually ending it. And that's sort of a one-way check valve you can't come back through uh, because once you realize that it's, it's sort of morally unjustifiable to say uh, there will always be some and I'm okay with that, uh, once you've come through that, it's hard to go back. And so we've made some great progress. We've housed over 4,000 people using the housing first method that many other uh, North American cities have adopted. The challenge is, um, you know, at the midpoint a couple of years ago, we're looking at this and thinking, well, how come we haven't eliminated homelessness? If, we, if there were 3,000 some people homeless in our city and we've housed 4,000 people, surely we've achieved our goal. And yet, what in fact happened was 3,000 more people became homeless in the city over the same period of time. And so the final pillar of the, um, uh, and we could have a long discussion about the need for more social housing to accommodate people, uh, particularly with complex addictions and mental health needs and, and the need for the federal government to be involved in that. And Brock, you and I have talked about that many times. Yes. And the mayors have a strong position on that. But um, uh, in addition to the need for more uh, permanent supportive social housing for people with extremely um, significant needs, the, the so-called hard to house. Um, the last pillar really, which is the prevention strategy, is we have to address the root cause of homelessness, which is poverty. And so uh, we did some soul searching as a council and, um, and settled upon this goal to, and decided that we needed to make the same transformation in our thinking from managing poverty uh, or reducing poverty to thinking about uh, eliminating it. And, and as I mentioned, this is particularly relevant um, because of the overrepresentation uh, of Indigenous people uh, in the poverty statistics uh, and in our homelessness statistics. If you're Indigenous, you're 10 times as likely to, to show up in the homeless population than non-Indigenous Canadians, and you're twice as likely to show up um, uh, in uh, in the poverty numbers and so there is a reconciliation dimension to this and this is relevant to I think all Canadian communities but particularly on the prairies where we have large and fast growing populations and we have the second largest uh, probably soon to be the largest urban Aboriginal population um, there is a, a reconciliation dimension uh, to this 
but ultimately it's actually a big drag on our economy too not to have a full participation of uh, you know these uh, marginalized folks in in our economy uh, even though uh, the, the majority of them are working they're working extremely low wage jobs sort of stuck in poverty traps and then likely to to transmit their condition to their kids in a lot of cases. So, uh, and then we know that those families are overrepresented in interactions with the justice system, which is very expensive in terms of municipal policing, very expensive in terms of provincial and federal justice costs, and very, very expensive for all of us in terms of healthcare costs as well, because poverty is uh, it correlates very strongly to uh, uh, to various forms of, of preventable illness, uh, from diabetes to cardiovascular challenges. Um, to mental health issues and so uh, poverty is actually costing us a fortune ironically and and so this isn't about necessarily applying a whole bunch of new resources this is in, in part about spending the resources that we put into government to make social change and into philanthropy uh, personally uh, to better effect to to prevent and uh, uh, poverty prevent homelessness and and actually uh, strengthen our economy and strengthen the durability and sustainability of our public services in the process. So that's an extremely wonkish answer as to, to why this is important. But but uh, the other side of it is that, um, you know, it's hard to be the optimistic mayor for um, seven out of eight Edmontonians and say that everything is fine and everything is great here when I know that that's not true because I've, I've visited those those homeless shelters, I've visited those inner city schools, uh, I've seen and met with those families that are struggling and I've, I feel a responsibility and our council feels a responsibility to act for them. That's, uh, that's, that's such compassion, Don. Um, you, you touched on the question of reconciliation, we'll come back to that in a sec, but before we get there, I just want to talk a little bit about the definition of poverty that you have adopted in Edmonton, because it's quite unique, and you touched on a little bit a few minutes ago, um, saying that your definition of poverty isn't just about economic deprivation, but it also accounts for the barriers of social, cultural, and political participation. Can you just talk a little bit about how you landed on this def definition and uh, what makes it so important? Well. In our initial work as a roundtable, we, we knew that there were questions of dignity, questions of inclusion, questions of fairness that, that go beyond um, simple economic indicators. And so trying to define poverty, therefore, is, is um, more complex than simply measuring it economically, though there's, there's a, there is, a, as I said, an inextricable economic dimension to this. But our thinking about this was really galvanized um, by input that we had from our Aboriginal Roundtable, which we convened to ensure that we had um, a, a respectful um, Indigenous lens on not only the experience of poverty, but um, programs and policies that would uh, resonate with and be relevant to Indigenous populations. And, and we worked um, with a, quite a, a good cross-section of uh, folks from the Indigenous community to, who then did their own consultations as well. But one of the things that we learned early on in the process is that um, uh, the Cree word for poverty, which is one of the main uh, Indigenous languages spoken traditionally uh, and, and still spoken here today, um, the word does not actually reference money. It talks about being impoverished in terms of connection to the community. And material resources are a component of that, but it's really about kinship and um, and inclusion. Uh, and so you'll see that actually reflected in our definition. Our definition is is, is our definition is is I think fairly straightforward. But it's in and it's before you on the screen here. And poverty is defined as when people lack or are denied economic, social, and cultural resources to have a quality of life that sustains and facilitates full and meaningful participation in the community. Um, so if we rectify this, that would be eliminating uh, the experience of poverty in our community. But we recognize that that, uh, that has dimensions of inclusion to it and social partic and political participation uh, that, uh, that go beyond uh, mere economic indicators, and that there are people who technically would not fit the definition of, 
of economic deprivation, according to the Statistics Canada numbers and so on and so forth, but who could still be considered Im impoverished in this way, or, or in other words, not fully included in community life. And I think you know, our city is, is stronger by striving to ensure that there is full inclusion from all walks of life in community life. And uh, so that's with, with some traditional knowledge and some understanding of, of the language and worldview of Indigenous peoples, we were actually inspired to take this uh, slightly broader view of, uh, of what it is to experience poverty in our community. That's so interesting. You and I have talked before about uh, the question of First Nations and, and uh, First Nations peoples living in cities and in urban areas. Uh, it's clear that moving towards reconciliation is one of your key priorities. Uh, what can the Edmonton strategy teach us about the role and inclusion of First Nations in poverty elimination? Well, as I said, uh, I, I think um, we learned a great deal from the Indigenous Roundtable, uh, uh, and we continue to learn a great deal um, uh, from their contributions and from the additional consultation that they've facilitated. Um, informally with the urban Aboriginal community and then uh, formally um, the work that we're doing with particularly the Confederacy of Treaty Six First Nations which is the territory that Edmonton uh, exists within and uh, so we are trying to uh, manifest respectful nation-to-nation -nation relationships with with the Confederacy, with our adjoining First Nations, with the Métis Nation of Alberta, uh, with Inuit representat representat representative organizations as well, um, because the building a city that lives and breathes the treaty spirit is, I think, critical uh, for for the whole country, I think it's it's we're trying to role model an approach that we think, um, and our, our council feels strongly, um, and I feel particularly strongly, not just as an honorary witness from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but again as mayor of a community that has so many young Indigenous people flocking here, seeking opportunity, um, in some cases fleeing really dismal conditions on their First Nations, and then coming to the cities not necessarily having the support. Um, that they would be eligible for on their reserves as well. So we have a, a giant um, national policy question about the urban Aboriginal strategy that is not as pressing in Eastern Canada because the population um, uh, is not as significant. But on the prairies in the West, it's it's very very significant. And and because of the representation in the in the poverty statistics, um, there is there is an there is a link here that cannot be ignored. And and so I think that. Um, achieving that definition of poverty elimination and, and achieving um, full participation in community life, not through assimilation. And, and actually, I saw a great quote from Wab Canoe, who's um, um, another honorary witness, and he said, you know, reconciliation is not a second chance at assimilation. Reconciliation is about those respectful nation-to-nation uh, -nation relationships about honoring the commitments that are reflected in our case specifically in Treaty 6 but also in other agreements and in other court findings that support the rights of Indigenous peoples to um, uh, to meaningful participation in community life on their terms. Uh, and so we, we tried to take that approach with building the strategy from uh, from the ground up by creating the round table and, and in recognition of the fact that there are unique historical circumstances, uh, particularly um, historical trauma and, and whether it's um, the experience of, of residential schooling and the highest number of residential schools uh, in Canada was in Alberta. The highest concentration of residential school survivors is in Alberta. Uh, I would, though I don't have uh, it broken down by city, I would not be surprised to find that the highest concentration in an urban area of residential school survivors is in Edmonton. But because so much of this work uh, has, has been grounded in an understanding about the intergenerational transmission of um, not just economic injustice but also uh, trauma uh, and these things are related, when you have families that um, were broken apart uh, by having the children taken away at five or at six, you know, the age of my children, it's, it's unfathomable. Um, and then, you know, to have 
their traditional clothing taken away, their hair cut, uh, uh, to be told that they could not speak their language anymore. They had to adopt a new s system of spirituality. Um, and to be, uh, you know, when, when the policy of the government was to kill the Indian in the child to save the man was, was uh, you know, that was the policy of our country. That has been extremely damaging. Um, and I think we're only beginning to come to terms with the significance of the intergenerational harm that that has caused. And, and then when you imagine a residential school survivor whose experience of, um, of parenting from the age of five upwards was in a boarding school run by um, uh, people who in some cases cared a great deal for the children, but in other cases uh, were, were either spiritually or physically or sexually abusive to these children, it's not hard to understand how the intergenerational transmission of that poverty can affect us still today because um, the role modeling for parenting uh, is impacted by that and so that's how and that's why there's an importance of recognizing um, the intergenerational survivors as well of residential schooling and I would suggest again that we probably have the highest concentration of that population as well anywhere that you would find in the country. So the, 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 the whole country grappling with the injustice of um, uh, the colonial approach to assimilating First Nations people which has backfired uh, and created, I would say, many of the challenges. And, and I just, I'll make one point, which is that, because uh, I'm quite passionate about this, I'm going on a little bit, I realize, but, but um, most of the stigmas that are commonly held and that you will hear at a bar or at a curling rink or wherever people might feel safe talking about them are that Indigenous people are um, deficient or lacking in some way, uh, morally or otherwise, because of the situations that we see them in. Um, and yet it's important to remember that these are the ones who survived. Incredible brutality, uh, famine, disease. These are some of the strongest and most resilient human beings we will ever meet. And yet because of uh, barriers of racism uh, and because of economic marginalization, their circumstances are very, very difficult. And to me, reconciliation will involve remedying that. Um, and in cities, uh, around issues of housing, around issues of childcare, around issues of income, I think we have an opportunity to make a difference. Working with other orders of government, of course, this isn't something we can address unilaterally, but we can certainly, we can certainly start from that position of the treaty spirit, which, which has guided our work um, from the very beginning. Yeah, you, you said in the middle there that uh, you're showing your passion. It's so true. I've, I've obviously seen it around the big city mayor's table, but uh, your passion for this reconciliation issue is, I think, a really, it's a really, it's, it's a beacon of hope, I would say, in the country. Anyway, um, one of the, moving on to the next question, uh, you know, we all, lots of places, in lots of organizations, there are plans, there are strategies. How, in this case, how? What's next? How will you implement the plan? Uh, how will? Uh, what will make it successful? Well, right now, it's it's a plan that is really held in the uh, by the municipality in the sense that we've taken the initiative to convene this. But it's not strictly speaking a municipal initiative. At least by the time it uh, it, it graduates, uh, it it, was, it is meant to be larger than that. And so when we built our task force, we deliberately reached out, as I mentioned earlier, to, uh, to uh, faith communities, uh, to the business community, to the research community, to the agency community, and to uh, organizations that, uh, um, that are connected to people who, who have the lived experience of poverty. And so we've, we've tried to build as broad a base as possible uh, in, in the network and then in the working groups that we built engaged many more communities and, and organizations as well. So we've attempted it from the very beginning to see this as movement building and uh, so and I think we're succeeding in doing that to the extent that uh, you know my co-chair Bishop Jane Alexander who's the Anglican Bishop for, uh, uh, for Edmonton uh, and the Archdiocese here, she has um, uh, 
pre uh, presented to I don't know hundreds of organizations and recruited thousands of people who are interested in 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 this work uh, and who have signed up uh, in in different ways to be counted in. And I see on the slide there it says count yourself in. And uh, so we're we're trying to build that army of people who are committed to this goal and who will assist in various ways and. And we have really so far built very good alignment with um, uh, some key organizations in, in the community here. Uh, one, for example, is the United Way, which since 2013 has had its stated goal of solving poverty. And that is uh, part and parcel and well aligned with um, uh, the End Poverty Edmonton goal. And, and their work, uh, which follows a Pathways Out of Poverty model, is is um, nested within uh, our uh, our strategy, and so um, that allows uh, private philanthropy, uh, workplace giving, workplace awareness uh, to occur uh, because of that unique partnership between uh, employers and labor, and uh, and now uh, having this this government connection to to what the United Way is doing. So they're they're a critical partner that's already aligning. You know, uh, uh, 20 plus million dollars a year worth of investment in in the community geared towards ending poverty, uh, and so we're you know we're tightening that alignment all the time. Our community foundation, which is uh, uh, very very strong, has now coming into alignment with this as well. So we're not just trying to uh, organize a civil society. We're not just trying to organize um, uh, advocacy organizations. Uh, and agencies. We're also trying to organize uh, this uh, philanthropic uh, space as well around this, and they're absolutely, you know, in lockstep with us, uh, which is which is fantastic. And then we've actually had the provincial government at our table at every step of the way because everything that we're recommending is is generally consistent with the province's social policy framework, which was built under the previous government, and which I, I I'm reasonably confident that the the new government here is going to uh, at least adhere to, if not magnify and amplify. And so, um, the next step then, really, uh, building on this this broader civil society movement and conversation, uh, trying to establish this consensus is worth pursuing. Um, the next piece of work is to um, really align our efforts specifically with the provincial government around. Uh, areas of overlapping jurisdiction, for example, housing uh, and income support, um, and then one of our other major recommendations around addictions and mental health. And given the over concentration of people with significant addictions and mental health issues in both our homeless population and in our um, population experiencing poverty, we need to closely align what we're doing with the provincial government. And, and frankly, the provincial government needs to increase its resources in this area. But on the simple premise that they will save money elsewhere in justice and in hospitals. Uh, there is there is a moral case for doing all of this, which I can go on at length about, but there is an equally strong business case uh, from a um, political economy point of view of doing this work. And there's an even stronger uh, public and societal business case around um, the productivity of those families if they're more fully included uh, and uh, their participation, for example, in the conventional housing market versus needing social housing. So if we do this, we will actually get by with less social housing in the future than we would need otherwise. Uh, and by the way, that stimulates the economy because you have people participating in consuming housing uh, and in buying goods in the city and being able to provide for their own families. So there is there is a, a multiple accounts case for doing this and we'll continue to articulate that as we work through uh, our plan is really out for consultation right now with our uh, with our public and so far what we're hearing in those consultations is very broad agreement that we have the right elements to the strategy uh, some uh, some tweaks here and there about language but generally speaking we're finding very strong uh, buy-in from across those different sectors and then I think the finish line and, and we continue to have this conversation with uh, uh, the new provincial government is how do we intertwine uh, our efforts so that ideally what I would love to see is a joint implementation plan. Uh, so the province has a goal to eliminate child poverty and they have a goal to substantially reduce adult poverty and um, our suggestion is that um, you know there may be a province-wide strategy for doing that but to make it really successful these these kinds of initiatives need to be grounded in community and so we would uh, 
present this to the provincial government, and they know this is coming, as the Made in Edmonton um, roadmap for how to eliminate poverty in our community within a generation. And uh, and so we'll seek that partnership, and and uh, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to make uh, measurable progress in the short to medium term towards this goal. And I would just add there is a hanging in the balance as with everything else these days there is the question of uh, the, the federal government's uh, participation uh, materially around issues of housing but also around uh, support for immigrants and refugee people I mean uh, we've had lots of discussion about Syrian refugees they're going to live in our cities they're going to need social housing they're going to face issues of discrimination and uh, and so as so that is how this looks on the ground in Canadian cities and then I talked at length about the need for a different approach in our urban Aboriginal strategy through a lens of reconciliation, through a lens of poverty elimination um, with, uh, with the federal government, whomever that may be, uh, next week. Yeah, whoever that may be. Um, I was interested in your comments about United Way. I, a couple of weeks ago I was speaking at and leading a discussion with United Way Canada about the municipal agenda and the United Way agenda in Edmonton. The example of Edmonton in the high the great collaboration between the city and United Way in Edmonton was clearly an example people were pointing to, which kind of acts as a bit of a segue to the question of like how do you how do you share this? How do you um, help others understand the, and learn from the Edmonton experience? And more specifically, um, so folks know, in April 2016, mayors from across Canada will be coming together in Edmonton. Uh, for a conference, Cities Reducing Poverty When Mayors Lead. So just uh, as a wrap up to this interview, Don, can you tell us uh, what your hopes are for this gathering? Well, I'm, I hope people will come, for starters, and uh, I hope that they will bring um, uh, examples of what they're doing in their communities because, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on us right now because of, um, partly because of the reconciliation angle which I think we've injected which is maybe new to this uh, uh, to a lot of the poverty um, elimination or poverty amelioration discussion in, in, in our country but we're really building on a lot of great experience I mean uh, Calgary's uh, poverty elimination uh, initiative um, is uh, has obviously informed our work and, and we thought long and hard about how we can work together as cities to drive the agenda with the province. Uh, other uh, um, mid-size um, Alberta cities have done similar work and so this exists in a larger context and in a sense we're late to the game so we have the benefit of learning from what uh, everybody else has done going back to extraordinary work that happened in, in Hamilton uh, uh, some years ago. And so there is a national uh, conversation happening and I believe very much in um, you know, driving solutions from the bottom up uh, that then enable and give um, imperative to, to address, but also political cover and support for senior orders of government to, in what would otherwise be, you know, an intensely divisive and partisan fray, uh, be able to say, you know, we have the support of local governments uh, to do this work because it is being called forth in a resonant and compelling way that we need to address uh, these issues for the success of our communities uh, and our cities in particular, which is part of the success of an increasingly urban country and so much as the big city mayors have come together uh, I think quite successfully uh, along with FCM uh, to uh, really raise the profile around issues of infrastructure and particularly of late issues of transit uh, we're not quite where we need to be on housing yet but that's another story um, I think our focus will continue there I, I do think there's an opportunity for us uh, as as local governments to be champions here because in a way we're sort of outside of the partisan and, and ideological fray and um, because we're uh, confronted every day particularly through policing but also you know that's a direct cost to us but also indirectly through social disorder and and concerns about productivity and and issues with housing affordability uh, in our communities uh, you know these issues are very pressing for us we we can't we can't simply punt them to the next term and so I think that there is a continuing opportunity for municipal leadership around reconciliation uh, and around social and economic inclusion because uh, I think there's an authenticity to, to the leadership that uh, local governments bring and more importantly um, the, the networks and movements that we can build as communities which uh, 
you know, which can call forth the kind of action that, you know, every policy wonk kind of knows we need to do um, in order to actually uh, make progress on some of these economic and social indicators. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this uh, this gathering will um, uh, demonstrate again, just as the Tamarack gathering uh, in February last year demonstrated, that there is uh, actually really extraordinary work and alignment at, um, happening at the local level across the country that we can build on. Well, we're certainly at FCM looking forward to uh, working with you and Tamarack on that initiative and, and promoting it and engaging in as most effective way as we can. So that uh, this comes to the brings us to the end of the the interview portion of this webinar. A um, couple of things I just really stand out for me. I mean, your comment on about the goal of a child born in poverty. Uh, needs to move in a way so that they don't carry poverty to the next generation. I thought it was a fascinating comment. Uh, but I also found particularly interesting your knowledge of Edmonton and the, the knowledge of the community um, and your your comment about the fact that you can go around and be very positive and optimistic about an Edmonton where but you know knowing that seven out of eight Edmontonians are having a pretty good life but it's a real problem that you understand that one in, one in eight are really struggling and that there's a real dedication obviously to help uh, those one in eight folks to um, rise uh, to a better quality of life for the strength of the whole community the, the last thing I'll say is I you know I, I sit in this job I've been in the job eight years I've met a lot of uh, mayors and see a lot of things going on and, and it never ever ceases to amaze me how complicated it is to run a city. And listening to you talk about sort of some of the, the challenges of alignment with other orders of government, the delivery of services, the managing of infrastructure and housing and the knowledge of your community and, and ultimately the true compassion that uh, that comes with all of this so that you you in, in particular but mayors generally across the country are really dedicated to um, making communities better places to live. It's a very, very impressive uh, story that you're telling and in a very complicated context. So we'd like to um, turn this now over to Kirsty, who's going to put forward some questions from folks who are on the call. Uh, I uh, need to leave for another commitment, so I'll just close by saying thanks very much, Don, uh, and thanks to Kirsty for setting this up. We'll leave, leave you in good hands with Kirsty as you go through some subsequent questions from the audience. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brock, for being a part of today's broadcast. And uh, this has certainly been an incredible, incredibly informative interview. And I know people will have some questions um, outside of the ones that were sent in advance. I will run through the advanced questions just one by one. But should you should there be leftover time for additional questions, we invite you to please send them through the questions box. Um, so. Mayor Iverson, the first question that we received um, was, was quite a popular one, actually. Quite a few people asked, what can I do on a daily level to support the strategy? Um, and in particular, what is the role for individuals with lived experience of poverty, um, people who are part of the business community, and also youth? Well, those are, those are great questions. And um, our report includes, uh, if you have a chance to access it, and I'm sorry, I'm flipping through it and you'll hear the sound of page turning, but there are a number of places where uh, the report suggests how you can have an impact in the community. And, you know, one thing that I recommend uh, anyone to have the opportunity is to attend the United Way's poverty simulation, to have an understanding, uh, I really break some stereotypes because, you know, it's one of those ridiculous stereotypes is that people in poverty are lazy and that's if they were less lazy they would not be in poverty but understanding the juggling that people with very limited resources do not just making the tough choices between uh, do I pay the rent or do I buy groceries um, uh, and or you know if I can barely afford both uh, who gets to eat is it me or is it the kids? I have to work, but the kids need to go to school. Those kinds of choices that people make um, are incredibly nerve-wracking. And then the the sort of paper chase that people with lived experience in poverty that we've learned about um, uh, it entails um, is sort of a non-stop logistical uh, balancing act. Is spinning many plates. You know, pick your metaphor, but. But um, being poor is actually uh, uh, incredibly time-consuming, and um, one of the one of the impoverishments is not just money, but then time. 
uh, to make those better nutritional choices or to even take advantage of you know the city's leisure access program which affords um, qualifying low-income families with uh, significantly discounted or free access to the city's recreation centers uh, um, for example and so it's not that people lack initiative it's that they often lack time and poverty simulations are, are uh, a really valuable way to help break down those stereotypes um, I think you know another thing that people can do uh, that, that we've recommended is uh, education, particularly around issues of um, uh, treaty rights and treaty obligations. Um, I never hesitate to uh, to take the opportunity to ask a room full of people um, who in this room is a treaty person, and um, you'll see a few hands go up, and most often they're indigenous hands. And then I put my hand up and people look very confused and I explain, no, no, the treaty is not just with indigenous people. Um, the treaty is between settlers and the descendants of settlers in the name of the queen uh, and um, sovereign first nations. And so, um, you know, that's an important realization that this is a, a bilateral arrangement and it's an enduring bilateral arrangement. And by the way, it's one we're not necessarily holding up our end of the bargain on. Um, and so opportunities to learn about that, and there's a great film by um, an indigenous and Anishinaabe filmmaker uh, named Alanis Obamsawin, and the, the film is available you know, for free on the National Film Board uh, website. That people can download it, view it you know, with their family or in their workplace or uh, you know, in their voluntary organization. Um, uh, the, the film is called Trick or Treaty, and it tells a story of Treaty 9, but it's a story that, that is um, transferable to um, any of the treaty areas uh, within the country to help understand what are the obligations of treaty uh, and also what, what have been some of the injustices or, or lack of fulfillment of treaty obligations on the part of uh, our federal government and, uh, and, and really then all of us as, as settlers and as um, descendants of settlers and beneficiaries of the treaties. And so so I, I think there's a lot of learning opportunities um, and again those are enumerated in in the plan itself um, but as for opportunities uh, um, to uh, to become involved particularly for people li with lived experience we've set aside special time in our consultation plan in order to ensure that uh, these recommendations are vetted by people with lived experience and so far our feedback has been very very positive uh, on that and then we also had a special engagement with um, uh, with youth in partnership with an organization called the John Humphrey Center here which connected us with uh, youth leaders and youth who had lived and current experience of poverty and led to some of the the recommendations that uh, that we're calling forth in here but uh, you know we'll want to continue to engage those communities as we move into implementation and and uh, think about uh, the, the governance of of this effort over time, which is something that we're still developing right now. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's an inclusive and comprehensive strategy. I think we'll try to include a link to the, the Trick or Treaty um, uh, video as well in our follow-up email for folks. Um, moving on to another question, um, how will you ensure the continuity of the action plan uh, should there happen to be a change in, in mayorship in the future? Well, that hopefully there won't be. The election's two years away, so, <laughs> and uh, I'm not announcing anything today about uh, my intentions one way or the other. But um, you know, we hope to uh, have this embedded, uh, and we haven't decided what's the most effective form of this. We're researching other Canadian examples, and I think it's something that we'd be happy to have advice uh, about the best way to embed this. Um, and and again, the idea is that it's not strictly speaking a, a municipal initiative. By the time it's done, we want it to be a more broadly held. Uh, multi-stakeholder community initiative to put it sort of in jargony terms but essentially something that that transcends local government I mean I've certainly played a role in leadership to convene the conversation but it can't depend on me and it can't depend on City Hall uh, to carry this forward and one of the key ways to do that is to uh, uh, s strengthen the partnership with particularly with the provincial government um, uh, around commitments to implement this uh, this agenda and um, uh, and I think that will be that will be the test I mean 
there are some things that the municipality can do, particularly around transit, for example, um, in the low income bus pass, provision of free passes to um, uh, agencies who work with marginalized youth uh, who would not be able to, for example, produce the, the, the requisite um, uh, tax filing information to substantiate their low income eligibility to get the discounted pass. So we just said, wait a second, we're creating an unnecessary paper chase there. What these folks need are really, you know, 100 free passes that they can uh, distribute uh, to, to um, kids in difficult circumstances um, and youth at risk in order to help them get to school, to get to services, to get to housing. Um, uh, not quite no questions asked, but um, um, with different barriers. And so things like that, I think, we'll proceed with and and hopefully a future council will not say, oh, that was that was silly. We're going to cut off the low income bus pass um, uh, uh, or stop working with these agencies because the business case around particularly working with the agencies is that our peace officers can spend a lot more time um, chasing um, middle and upper class people who are on our system who haven't paid uh, rather than chasing around and criminalizing the poverty of at-risk youth who are on our transit system and who literally could not pay and can't pay the fines and wind up in the remand center, uh, uh, you know, in, in breach of, uh, of um, because of a bylaw infraction. And so, you know, taking those different approaches, I hope that that will, that will cement itself. But ultimately, the test of this will be whether the community uh, takes it up and advocates from the business community, from the academic community, from the faith community, uh, to to ultimately and chiefly the provincial government to uh, make good on these recommendations, particularly around housing, particularly around mental health, particularly around early learning and care, and particularly around income support, which are chiefly constitutionally the domain of of the province. But we we offer this to them not as an ultimatum, but as as the tailored, um, made in Edmonton, ready to go strategy to help them do what in their heart of hearts they want to do, uh, but need maybe political cover to to proceed with. And so we're uh, I'm I'm happy to take that uh, take that spear in order to get this work done. Certainly an initiative that we'd love to see happen. Um, the joint implementation with the province. Uh, just noting the time, it looks like it's uh, three minutes to the hour, so I am going to wrap up the question period. Thank you so much, Mayor Iverson, for being part of today's broadcast and for sharing the Edmonton strategy with all of us. Well, thank you very much for uh, reaching out, creating this opportunity, and to everyone who's listening, thank you for your, uh, your interest and your support. And we look forward to seeing you uh, at the Cities Reducing Poverty When Mayors Lead gathering next April. I better make sure that's in my calendar. <laughs> we'll make sure it's in there. So um, just just a couple of closing announcements before we end. Um, I'd like to invite you all again, everyone on the webinar, to um, certainly join us April 5th through 7th in Edmonton for the gathering uh, that we spoke about, Brock mentioned earlier as well. And registration for this event will be opening in early November. Um, we have a link here on the screen where you can express your interest in receiving uh, email updates um, about that event. Um, and another event coming to Edmonton is Tamarack's, uh, oh, Tamarack's Community Engagement, the Next Generation Workshop, there's the slide. And this is coming uh, to Edmonton in November 24th through the 26th. Um, participants of this workshop will explore the latest community engagement thinking, practices and techniques, and interact with technology that will transform how you engage with your clients, customers, funders, and partners. And for more information or to register, please visit the link on the screen here as well. Um, and we will make sure that you have links to all of these uh, resources in our follow-up email. Um, in addition, if you like today's webinar and actually want to dive a bit deeper into the End Poverty Edmonton strategy, uh, we'll be hosting a call, uh, a comp, uh, community practice call on October the 20th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Lucenia Ortiz from End Poverty Edmonton will be presenting more information about the strategy, um, and Adam Vasey, also from Windsor Essex, will be presenting the City of Windsor's poverty reduction strategy. So if you're interested in coming to this call and asking more questions, please RSVP through the link on the screen. Uh, we are uh, also running uh, a three-day workshop um, in Montreal at the end of this month, October 27th through the 29th. Evaluating community impact is uh, co-led by Liz Weaver from Tamarack and Mark Kabaj of Here There Consulting. Um, and there are still some seats left, so if you are interested in diving into evaluation, uh, you can register through the link on your screen there. 
And finally, we'd love to keep in touch, and we want to encourage you to subscribe to the Mayor's blog at donivison.ca, um, and also to our Vibrant Communities monthly newsletter, Communities Connect. Uh, it's poverty e-news that you get straight to your inbox each month. And we also invite you to join our online community for poverty reduction practitioners at vibrantcanada.ca. In a few days, we will email you with links to the presentation recording um, and other related materials. Um, and we encourage you also to email us at tamarack at tamarackcommunity.ca to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.